it's up there. All right, so let's talk about temperature, shall we? Measures of temperature. So there's all these ways that we might specify temperature and in thermal equilibrium, they would all be exactly the same thing, but if you're not in thermal equilibrium, they'll all be different from one another. So uh, I'm trying to remember, did, did we do this already, this, like listing the different we, measures of yeah, temperature? Yeah, we, we, we finished the uh, gas pressure and the radiation pressure part. Um, the right, but, right, but what we haven't said is there's effective temperature, excitation temperature, ionization. Oh, okay, see, I just wanted to be sure I wasn't repeating. Because I think I was mentioning at the end of last yeah. time that we were going to do this. So there is something we've already mentioned. There is effective temperature from the Stefan Boltzmann law. In practice, what astronomers will often do is you can predict for a black body what B minus B would be. If I were to observe a black body through a B filter and a B filter and find the magnitudes and take the difference B minus B, there's a nice correlation between temperature and B minus B. So in practice, color temperature for astronomers is related to the B minus B color index is typically used. 
increase. Yeah, the more the negative it is, the bluer the The more negative, the bluer. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so often the, the, the word color temperature is specifically used to refer to what you would define from the B minus B uh, color index. in thermal physics and statistical mechanics is that in thermal equilibrium, every process occurs at the same rate as its inverse process. So ionization takes place at exactly the same rate as recombination. Atoms jump from n equals, hydrogen atoms jump from n equals 1 to n equals 3 at the same rate that other ones are jumping from n equals 3 to n equals 1. So the idea is that, statistically speaking, while individual atoms and particles are changing their states, the fraction of particles in a given state is not changing with time. And so time. overall, there's no statistical changes in the properties. And that's why it's thermal equilibrium. Thermal equilibrium, every process occurs at the same rate as its inverse process. species is much shorter than the characteristic distance over which the temperature changes appreciably, then that particle will tend to thermalize with other particles in its vicinity. So um, I'm not going to give a precise definition of the temperature changes appreciably because there is no precise definition of that. We kind of consider things on a case-by-case -case basis. So the idea is that let's say that the temperature of the floor and the ceiling differed by one Kelvin, let's say, okay? Then um, if the mean free path for particles was a millimeter, then it would be safe to say that it's a good approximation that there's thermal equilibrium uh, in any small region of this room because the particles bump around long before they're in the region where the particles are moving very differently from the particles that they were surrounded by to begin with. And to thermalize is for particles to have enough collisions with one another that they redistribute their speeds according to the maxwell holtzman distribution, for example. So as long as particles don't move very far 
compared to the distance over which the way the particles are moving, the temperature is related to that. Uh, if they don't move very far compared to the distance over which there's a significant change in temperature, then they'll bump around with enough particles that are uh, in their vicinity that they'll redistribute their speeds according to the maxwell boltzmann distribution, and you can say that what we call local thermodynamic equilibrium is a good approximation. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, if the mean free path, average distance between collisions of a particle species, the mean free path in general is different for different species. So you can have one species might be uh, in local thermodynamic equilibrium, another one won't be because it might travel further between collisions. So those particles might, might start in a region where the temperature is one thing, and by the time they collide with something else, that region has a very different temperature. And so then that's not, for that species, local thermodynamic equilibrium is not a good approximation. So we'll write all that. The mean free path of a particle species is much shorter than the characteristic distance over which the temperature changes appreciably. particle species will tend to thermalize with the other particles in their vicinity. Also then, but so then particles of this species the local temperature. for these particles. And so again, we didn't give any kind of you know, precise definition of the characteristic distance over which the temperature changes appreciably. But there are various kind of standard measures for that. 
And probably the most common one is what we call the temperature scale height. But before I launch into that, I should say, what questions do you have? When you say the word, what exactly do you mean by characteristic density? Yeah, so let me, let me describe what the temperature scale height is. And you'll see an example of what we mean by that. I deliberately, we deliberately leave it open. In other words, um, we kind of, on a case-by-case -case basis, might decide, well, what do we mean by that in this situation? What would be appropriate to call the characteristic distance over which the temperature changes appreciably in this situation? In general terms, we would mean a distance over which the temperature changes, the, the change in the temperature is comparable to the change the, to the temperature that you started with. So in other words, in this room, temperature is something like 300 Kelvin. So if, it's, if the temperature is, is 290 Kelvin on the floor and 289 Kelvin on the ceiling, then that's not a significant temperature change. It's, you know, it's a fraction of a percent of the temperature, uh, of the average temperature within the room. And so the size of the room would be smaller than what you might call a, 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 a distance over which it's changed appreciably. But on the other hand, if the temperature is 300 at the bottom of the room and 200 at the top of the room, oh, now we're talking. That, now we're talking a significant change in the temperature. So can I be more specific? Yes, I can. No, I actually can't. I'm going to be more specific. I'm going to give a common definition of that. So one measure of the characteristic distance over which the temperature changes appreciably is what we call the temperature scale height. which is h sub t, so the h is supposed to think, you know, make you think of the word height. h sub t is defined to be, at any given location, the temperature divided by the magnitude of the temperature gradient. Or in other words, it's the temperature divided by the magnitude of the temperature gradient. Here I'm thinking of r as the coordinate for distance. Because in stars, r would be the distance from the center of the star, for example. Or in Earth's atmosphere, r could be height above the ground, or distance from the center of the Earth, or something like that. And there's a couple of ways we could think about that. So for example, suppose that I had a situation where here's r, and dt dr was constant, so that t looked something like that. So here is T of R and versus R. It's just a straight line plot like that. Then if you think about it, dt dr is constant for this, right? Mm -hmm. So dt dr is going to be the distance over which the temperature would drop to zero from your location if the temperature gradient, the rate of change of temperature with distance, stayed constant. Ht is the distance over which the temperature would go from zero to t, or t to zero. Constant. 
is if I pick any point along here, and that's at some temperature t, then if I took uh, if I if I want to find the TDR, then uh, I would take change in t over change in distance, right? Mm -hmm. So in other words, we would have that the TDR was t over h t at that location. So h t would be the distance over which the temperature would be zero from your location. Well, that would be a, certainly a significant change in the temperature, right? Going all the way from your current temperature down to zero, right? That's maybe a little too extreme. More realistically, a temperature gradient, or more realistically, a temperature profile in an atmosphere might be something like an exponential decay of temperature with height. That's something that would be, it's, it's not exactly true in Earth's atmosphere, for example, but um, it's certainly not exactly true, but that would be something more realistic than a uniform temperature gradient like that. And we can also then interpret the scale height in terms of that situation. So another interpretation if we had T is equal to some initial temperature E to the minus R over H sub T Exponential decay, in other words. And in that case, if we took the TER and then we took its magnitude, then notice well, if I differentiate this with respect to R. I would get minus 1 over ht times t mod e to the minus r over ht, just using the, uh, the uh, chain rule. So I would get, then after taking the absolute magnitude, t naught over ht times e to the minus r over h sub t in that case. So then if I took T over the magnitude of TDR, then that would be, in fact, HT in that case. That would be the scale height because then um, T is T naught equal to minus R over HT. The TDR is T naught over HT, E to the minus R over HT. So when I took the ratio, I would just get HT right there. So in other words, the scale height is also, if you have an exponential decay, the scale height is the thing that appears up there in the exponent. Mm -hmm. So in other words, it's the E folding distance. If you change R by HT, the temperature drops to 1 over E of what it started as. the scale height, the temperature scale height, is the E folding distance. If you change R by HT, then T drops by a fact, drops to 1 over E of its initial value.
And so this is an exponential decay. So in that case, the scale height is the same everywhere. Notice that over here, with our linear temperature run with radius, that HT is not constant, right? HT, ETDR is constant, so HT changes as T changes in that situation. But in an exponential decay like this, which is a more common situation, the temperature is more likely to look similar to that than it is similar to that. In that case, the scale height is absolutely constant. No matter where you start, if you go a distance equal to the scale height, you're one over e of where you of, of the initial temperature. Did you get enough sleep? No, I didn't sleep well last night. Not really. Uh, that's not good. Yeah. Okay. No, no. Yep. Yeah. So that that's the deal. So this would be a case where the scale height is constant, and so we could define, you know, so then if we were doing the local thermodynamic equilibrium thing, if the mean free path is very small compared to the scale height, you've got local thermodynamic equilibrium. But if the mean free path is comparable to the scale height or bigger than the scale height, well then the particle travels to a region where the temperature is very different by the time it collides and everything. And so uh, it's collisions that thermalize, it's collisions that redistribute speeds to be appropriate for the local temperature. So if a particle doesn't collide until it's in a region with a very different temperature, you can't expect those particles to be able to thermalize because they're not colliding with other particles in a region that all has about the same temperature. They go way far away before they collide with somebody. So it's like if you, you know, if you uh, put on your jacket and then you step outside into the cold weather before you next bump into somebody, you're not thermalizing if you're a particle because mm -hmm. it's you know it's it's very different outside than it was where you put your coat on, so to speak. Mm So now we'd like to find a way to estimate what the mean free path is. Or do you need to write some more for mm -hmm. So mean free path is another thing that I get tired of writing over and over again. So I'm going to call it the MFP, which they don't even do this anymore, I don't think. But Colgate Toothpaste used to say, with MFP as their little buzzword, which meant maximum fluoride protection. Oh. So, so LTE has been taken over by the cell phone industry, MFP has been taken over by Colgate, whatever. Uh, to find the MFP, consider hard spheres of radius R. So real atoms are quantum mechanical fuzz balls, but let's think of them the classical way, more of billiard balls that have a definite radius and either smack into one another or they miss just to keep things simple. Mm -hmm. To find the MFP, consider hard spheres of radius R. So what if we're, what if we're modeling hydrogen atoms in the ground state? The reasonable thing to do would be to take the radius equal to the first four radius. Mm -hmm. Just imagine that that's what our hydrogen atoms are. Say, and they're like, no, we're going to not do that. Um, oh well. Uh, for an H atom in the ground state, we would use I know. Tell them about it. We would use R equals A naught. Or 
previously first forward. So then two particles collide if their centers pass within two R of one another. Because if we've got a bump, then the two R is the distance between their centers. So we imagine a sphere of radius 2r moving through the gas. And it's sweeping out the tube, right? In other words, if you imagine it's, it's making a tunnel, if you will, that is like a tube, like a straw. And so then that tube is full of point atoms. The gas as a whole is full of point atoms, if you will, in this simplified model. And that sphere is moving at speed v, which could, for example, be vRMS for the particles, or something like that. A sphere of radius 2r moves with speed v through a stationary through a collection of stationary points representing the centers of other particles. Tube 
should stay constant even as some move in and others move out. So let's just make them behave and just sit there. A collection of stationary points representing the centers of other particles. Time t, the sphere moves a distance vt. And so we're going to ask ourselves, okay, in time t, how many collisions does it make? That'll be re that'll be equal to the number of the points in the tube that it swoops out. Mm -hmm. So then we'll get mean time between collisions and then we'll turn that into a mean free path. Or actually we'll just get the mean free path directly, but we'd also get the mean time between collisions this way as well. and sigma is the standard symbol for it. Uh, amusingly enough, the, the unit usually used for sigma, sigma has units of area, is the barn, B-A-R-N, and I believe that is a joking reference to the idea of being able to or not able to hit the side of a barn. So somebody who's not very good at throwing will say, he couldn't hit the side of a barn they were trying to throw at it. So I believe that the barn was basically came from that as a joking reference. Anyway, uh, sigma will be pi times 2r squared, just the cross-sectional area of the sphere. Because that's the cross-sectional area of the tube that it is sweeping out. 